morning. How are you all today? So, um, where was I going? First off, is it okay with the lighting like this, or do I do you want the front lights up, or does that make it easier or worse? Good. Before we dive into the lecture, that's not really a lecture. Do you want to? Talk about pharmacology and cardiac dysrhythmias. Do you want to talk about cardiac dysrhythmias? Just to sort of make sure we're all on the same page. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm seeing some nods. Okay. Yeah, you have a quiz. I know. <laughs> I already heard about that. Um, who was it that had the AFib? So you want to talk about your patient and what happened and what they did and what you thought they should be doing, or were you just like, oh my god? Well, they actually didn't have to intervene with medications okay. with her. So it, it happened very quickly, and her heart rate jumped to 170, and then all of a sudden we got her sitting back down, and she was fine. Okay. And the, we didn't, we so she converted on her own? Yeah. She, did she go back into a, like a sinus rhythm? Yeah. Did you get a chance to look at the strip that... Um, did they capture that when she went into AFib? I didn't see her strip for that. Were alarms going off and stuff though? I mean, how did people know she was suddenly in AFib? They have, um, with before, they have someone watching all of them. Okay, so she's on so a telly box and somebody was... Calling the nurse. And you were, and you were, if you, when you're working on those floors, learn to pay attention because they actually, all those um, Phillips monitors, they all have alarms attached to them. Mm -hmm. Did you know that it's a, I think it's a felony to turn the alarms off or down. I know that it's definitely a policy violation and it's a legal violation. So if you if you decrease the, the volume of these heart monitor alarms, you can't do that. And that's obviously for patient safety. I mean, you know, and you'll find you know that some of your patients are alarming all night. If you're working on a shift, like, oh, there they go again. They're in and out of AFib, or they're having you know. Hopefully, they're not on the floor and not being treated for moments of VTAC or VFib. So, oh, that's a, yeah, mine does that too. It just makes me crazy. So I forgot to turn it off. Um, what? Um, this came up earlier when there were only a couple of people. Actually, I, I need to back up for a second. The flipped classroom. I was not clear on the concept last week. I went back and reread the syllabus just so that you are clear on it. I know you all form groups, and I really appreciate the effort. But the way that actually works is, and it won't start today, it'll start next time we meet. I get to randomly ask one of you to do a five minute presentation on one of the drugs that has been under discussion or that you were to have read about. I think this is to encourage you to read about your drugs. You get five minutes to prep and then you get to come up and talk for five minutes and I get to sit back and listen and ask questions. So, anyway, enough on that. So, um, at least I have all your names because I realized with the, um, uh, like the news forum and, and the group emails and stuff, the way I'm set up as a TA, I see the entire class, and if I send off an email using the news form, I'm going to be informing um, Professor Crane's group as well about the intent. So I've got to figure out how to put a little group email together for just you. Okay, get it back to VFib, AFib. So which one, if, when we're talking fibrillation, which one's potentially fatal? VFib. VFib, right. So what's, what's happening with... Oh, he's going to drive both of us crazy, all of us crazy. What? Why is VFib potentially fatal? Well, it's not fatal. It's not Because the ventricles supply blood to the entire body, and if it and flutters and you can't get enough blood out, then you're not getting any blood out. Yeah, yeah, it's just nothing <clears throat> going on. Uh, when somebody goes into VFib, if you were actually in the hospital in their room, what would you expect to see? Did they pass out? Yeah, their eyes roll up. They just, I mean, it doesn't. How long does it take for blood not getting to the brain for you to lose consciousness? It's like seconds. Um, 
And in fact, that's one of the things, you know, when you when the alarms go off and you run into the room, the first thing we do is, Mr. Jones, Mr. Jones, you try and get their attention and see if they're responsive. Uh, you'll learn all that in ACLS. Have any of you signed up for like ACLS classes? I'm not going to encourage you to do so at this point. If you get hired into a unit or a hospital that requires ACLS, they will pay for the training. If you do it on your own, you're out about 250 to 300 dollars. Um, so it's really, you know, as new grads, new nurses, I honestly don't know that it really is going to make a difference in your hiring opportunities. I can't say it improves it or decreases it, but I don't know about you guys, but when I graduated from school, which even was not all that long ago, I didn't have a lot of money to spare. So, you know, two or three hundred dollars was something I had to think about. And um, I had I had the benefit of actually precepting in the um, in the ICU. So, you know, they were willing to hire me into that unit anyway, and then said, you know, you have six months to get your ACLS training, and by the way, we'll provide it. That's kind of the way it works. And actually, I don't know, I think it is, at least with Kaiser, that all of their hospitals now require ACLS for all floors. It's just part of the deal. Uh, it didn't used to be that way. So let's get back to your, your dysrhythmic patient. Um, she stood up, went into AFib, I mean, yeah, AFib, and then sat back down and converted on her own. Why was she actually in the hospital? What was her background? Uh, has a history of all sorts of things going on, but mainly in the last couple of days, she had been getting short of breath, um, really tired, and her daughter was getting concerned. Um, brought her in, and then she, when she brought her into the ED, she went to in the ED, and then went back to sinus rhythm. So, so, what are the symptoms? You know, for a person walking down the street that doesn't know what AFib is. What are their symptoms when they go into AFib? What might they experience? Shortness of breath. Shortness of breath. Fluttering feeling. Like they may or may not, you know, they'll talk about palpitations, but they may or may not experience that, or they may not be aware of it. But their exercise tolerance drops significantly. So it's like, yeah, I've got no energy, I'm short of breath, they might get dizzy, they exhibit all the symptoms of a drop in blood pressure and a drop in effective circulation. How much does how much do the atria contribute to your cardiac output? So in other words, when you go into AFib and you're not actually the atria are no longer contributing really to uh, ventricular you know filling and preload and all that good stuff. What's the, how much is your blood flow diminished because you're in AFib? Um, you're close, yeah. It's, it's around 25%. So, if you, I'm going to have to work on this, so. so. Um, if somebody has had a lifetime experience of going into AFib and stuff, they probably are going to be less cognizant of it because it's kind of their daily experience in and out. If they've never had AFib before, they're aware of it. At least what they're aware of is that something's wrong, <laughs> you know? I don't feel good. I get dizzy when I stand up. So it may be, now, what kinds of situations can predispose somebody to AFib? Do you have any idea? Dr. Have you ever talked about this at all, or just previous you're going to get quizzed on it? Hmm? Would it be like a previous heart attack or some kind of... It's a, well, that could be, but I mean, it doesn't have to be that serious. Maybe like electrolytes? Electrolytes? Okay, good. Anything else? Dehydration. You know, reduced blood volume. I mean, for some people, they can, they'll sit there and, you know, flip in and out. Um, so for her, they didn't actually do anything because she converted when she sat back down. Given what you have read over the last couple of days, what had they had to intervene with with drugs? Any thoughts about what drugs they might have used as an intervention? That's today's lecture, by the way. It's 
Oh, I'm not asking Josh just you, but that's for the class. Yeah, Diltiazem. Okay, so what kind of a drug is Diltiazem? What, what class of drug is it? Well, it, it impacts muscle, you know, contraction. But how does it do it? What's what's the? It actually is in a group of you know the generic. Uh, drugs that are like diltiazem are all called. Vasodilate. No. Dilate to relax the Think think electrolytes. Calcium. Think a different electrolyte. Calcium. Calcium. Calcium, calcium channel blocker. Yeah. Exactly. So when you go back and review your physiology, what role does calcium play in muscle contraction? Well, it, it, well, calcium itself is, is critical to uh, the heart of the heartbeat. So if you block the calcium channel, right, is the heart rate going to speed up or slow down? Slow down. Yeah, because it takes longer for it to repolarize and I'll do all that stuff. So that's, diltiazem is one. And often what they'll do is they'll actually give them an IV push, dilt, or diltiazem, to see what happens. If you have somebody who's in rapid ventricular response, like your patient was, um, what's another test they might do to see, again, if they're trying to identify the rhythm and see if it's a supraventricular tachycardia or some other aberrant rhythm? And wouldn't they just put on a 12-lead EKG and you know, when somebody's running like, okay, I, I have, or I used to have, uh, WPW, Wolf Parkinson White Syndrome, which is, which is again, uh, a regantrin superventricular tachycardia. When I would go into AFib, my heart rate would jump up to 210, 220, and it was like, when I was in the ED looking at the monitor, I was doing fine until I saw the monitor and it was like, oh my God, I'm too old for that test. You know, that's somebody, that's an athlete that's, you know, doing the mile. Um, so there is a drug you can give somebody. That, the problem with the 12 lead at that point is everything is so mashed together, it's very hard to identify the rhythm. Because your heart's beating 200 times a minute, so that's, you know, that's four, almost four beats per second. So and you've got in there, you've also got your atria doing whatever they're doing, and it's hard to really understand what that rhythm is. So there's a treatment you can use that will help differentiate, and it's used in the emergency room or even in the intensive care. But anybody know what that is? Okay, so they'll use, they can use an adenosine bolus. They'll push adenosine, like maybe six, 12 milligrams. And it has to be done quickly. And that will slow the heart rate down and help identify whether it's, you know, if they're an AFib with a with rapid response or something, you know, something else is going on. And there's, there's a potential side effect, brief, but one that you and the patient probably should be aware of. And anybody, you, you look like maybe, since you started on the, tell me your name. Misha. Misha. So that's the side effect. They may have a one or two second pause. Is that hmm? Well, that's a pause. Oh. Yeah, the heart stops. Yeah, this is a little different. I mean, it's, when you say flatline, it just means there's no electrical activity. Uh, and with adenosine, it just it slows the um, transmission down so much that everything pauses. Now, you may have a patient on the floor that's got like a third degree block or something like that, and they may be having repeated two or three second pauses, which is actually quite terrifying if you're the nurse. The patient may be used to it, depends on it. Okay, well, we should probably actually move on with the lecture topic. Unless you object. So, Let's talk about antidiuretics. You know, they, they basically work by blocking the 
the flow of the ion channels, and you know, sodium, calcium, potassium, or they change the automaticity. So what is what is automaticity when you talk about the heart? Just the automatic let go. The automatic yeah. So, the what, there's actually three different levels of automaticity in the heart. Anybody know what they are? Come on, I know, I know you know, you just don't know you know it. Okay, so the SI node has an intrinsic rate of. How about the AV node? And if neither of those are functioning, what is the one remaining rhythm? And what's their rate? 15, 40. Yeah. So in your ACLS class, when you finally take it, you'll, you'll hear that referred to as an escape rhythm. And as my uh, instructor used to say, they're escaping death. You he also used to say, when you're dealing with that people, because that's when people are in VFib or flatlined, uh, they're dead. And you know, the chant, the goal is trying to bring them back. Um, <clears throat> I'm actually, actually talking, talking about pharmacology instead of a ACLS. But I'll ask this one last question. And I asked this, I think I mentioned it before in one of the previous lectures. You know, you see it on TV all the time. Oh, the flatline shock! You know, the, do you shock a flatline? No. no. Do you know why? I hear mumbling. Say it out loud. Something about electricity. Somebody. There's no like, electrical current. Yeah, so the, the heart is, shows no electrical activity for you to cardiac or somebody, for you to stimulate that electric. There has to be electrical activity because really what that shock does is hopefully reorganize the electrical, the electrical activity. So somebody that's in VTAC or VFib, you've got you know this weird electrical activity, and really what you're trying to do is kind of reset the heart and say, boom. Here, you know, everybody go together and, you know, follow the follow conductor, as opposed to everybody, you know, band, uh, rehearsing every instrument on their own, each one doing random things. Okay. So when we talk about the, the drugs that affect the heart, there's classes of one through four. And, you know, class four is for the miscellaneous drugs. What is the primary, <laughs> what is the most common side effect of an anti -disorder? I heard him mumble again. Say it out loud. Be, be, be brave. No, I don't. Hmm? Well, can they all create new dysrhythmias? Exactly. That is, in fact, the most common side effect is dysrhythmias. Uh, and so that's just one of the reasons that they're, they're used with caution and it's something you pay close attention to. Um, they can actually make, yeah, they, in fact, it was there, a second bullet point. They can make a new dysrhythmia. They can actually increase mortality. And in many cases, they have a, a narrow therapeutic margin. And often, they're toxic very quickly. So the class one drugs are being used less and less frequently. And in those, that, those groups, you've got the sodium channel blockers. So anytime you're blocking a channel, you're going to be usually slowing down the heart one way or another because it takes longer to repolarize for one reason or another. Um, and if you've got, act, what's an ectopic pacemaker? Like an outside pacemaker? Yeah, when they talk about somebody having activity, what they're saying is some other site in the heart, other than the established you know, nodes, is telling the heart, oh, 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 I think we should go now. <laughs> you know, as opposed to, you know, the conductor over there is, is when it should be in charge. So, the, you know, this is, um, activity is, is not, <laughs> usually not good. Uh, your, 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 your female patient who went into the superventric or tachycardia, if she has a reentric syndrome, one of the long-term things they might do for her is to send her to the cath lab and actually do a, an ablation. Any, any of you heard the term? Uh, ablation? You will. You will. <laughs> That's next week. Okay. Well, we're going to talk about it real briefly right now. What they do is they insert a catheter into the femoral vein. 
So thinking about it, then in your place, your mention is having a sense place. Do they go through the vein or the artery? Artery, artery right. Because you can't get to the. The only way, if you went through, if you went through the femoral vein, the only way to get to those, you know, those arteries supplying heart would be to go all the way through the heart, through the lungs, and back out the other side, which probably wouldn't work well. So, so for ablation, what they do is they go through the femoral vein and get into the um, uh, right, right atrium, or you know, in that area, and then they, you know, they, they use computers and some sophisticated stuff to treat, try and locate where the where the ectopic beat is actually coming from, and then they use like radio frequency, which is an essence microwave, uh, to see if they can actually burn, you know, create scar tissue at that point, so that it is no longer sending off these ectopic signals. So all your sodium channel blockers can make things worse. And yeah, I never did any of these. Well, lidocaine occasionally. So. If you have somebody that's getting potassium, they will sometimes get an admixture of lidocaine. Why, why would that be? Have any of you given an IV potassium yet? Yeah. Doesn't it burn it, it can be really painful. There are, if the patient's on, say, NS at 100 an hour as well, you know, you might look at it through that and do a white side to help dilute the potassium that's running in the That can help. That's actually legitimate. It's okay. They're, they're compatible because uh, potassium is, in fact, diluted in NS. So if you have one running at, you know, uh, 100 over 4 hours, isn't it? It's a slow, it's actually a fairly slow period, right? I think it's on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have to go back and review that. Because we didn't, in the ICU, we actually gave high, you know, <laughs> we gave high alert versions of the testing. That was, that was 50. Um, yeah, they were getting, that's what it is. They get 10, 10 mil equivalents in a take back of 100 and that over an hour. Um, as opposed to 50 mil equivalents in a bag going over an hour. Five times dose. So you can you can do a white site and help dilute that further. But if that's not working, sometimes you know doctor will order lidocaine. But so one of the effects of lidocaine is that it's a sodium channel blocker. So you may actually, while you're giving them potassium, and if they're if they're hypokalemic, what's one of the things that you're worried about? Hmm? Why are you worried about the heart? Key electrolytes in the so is it, if they're hypokalemic, are they going, isn't that like they're, they've already been given a potassium channel blocker? Yeah. So they're, they're things that it dysregulates. Well, now you're adding a sodium channel blocker to that, which can also exhibit dysregulates. So there's, there's a risk. So I, I only saw that done a couple of times. Beta blockers. Now, what receptor site do beta blockers affect? The AB node? No, I'm talking about actual. Yeah, beta one. Well, actually, beta sites, yes. How many? Okay, so this is this can be a use, useful mnemonic for the beta implants? Because there's. How many kinds of beta sites are there? Two. Yeah, there's beta 2 and beta 1. Which one impacts asthmatics? Two. So how, is there a risk with a beta blocker that you might actually exacerbate their asthma? Yes. yes. How do you know, how do you differentiate whether it's beta 2 or beta 1 site? Where, where are the beta 1 cells located and where are the beta 2 cells located? <laughs> so the mnemonic is you have two lungs and one heart. And so the goal is to in fact, you know, just control at the beta ones. But sometimes they have the side effect of messing with the beta twos, which can trigger uh, you know the asthma attack. And they were used for A flutter, A fib, tacky dysrhythmias, um, heart failure, hypertension, you know, there's what what drugs 
what's the generic name? What's the generic um, law. sucks? The law. <laughs> LOL. Yes. All the L's. The metropolol, the tenolol, those are the drugs that, um, ethanol, these are the drugs that, that are beta blockers. What is one of the things that a beta blocker can disguise that might be relevant out in the world outside of the hospital? Or even in the hospital, for that matter, kind of think of it. What's the symptom of hypoglycemia? What other, what cardiac symptoms are there with hypoglycemia? Tachycardia. If somebody's on a beta blocker, will they exhibit that? They may not. So somebody could be, in fact, profoundly hypoglycemic, and <laughs> that's why part of the ACLS protocol is you check their blood sugar. Are they, is their heart not working because actually they don't have any sugar in their blood, or is it something else? Oh, okay. Panel. So ethanol is actually a very uh, short acting. You'll actually have patients maybe in the hospital that are on an ethanol drip, but it's not something that they go home with. Um, they're going to go home with a tenolol, a trovolol, and it depends on their half life and all the things that go with that for you know, whether they're going to take it once a day or twice a day, uh, what, you know, what works. And the adverse effects, I mean, they can really, they can have some life-changing effects. They really can affect, you know, their, their sex drive. Uh, in many instances, they will exhibit the first dose effect. Anybody want to tell me what a first dose effect is? Is it in your book? I hope so. Somebody want to Google it? It's a sudden and severe fall of blood pressure. Okay, they've never had metropolol before. They're in the doctor's office and they say, we're going to put you on metropolol, you'll have your first dose here. Patient stands up, falls down. Or you're in the hospital and you've just started your patient on patrol law and they decide to get up and go to the bathroom. And they get up and they fall down. Because basically they have an orthostatic bend because their blood pressure just goes. And the body takes, it, it, it takes a little while for the body to adjust to this drug and how it's, how it's impacting. Usually it's, it's a one-time thing. But they are more you know, prone to orthostatic hypertension and changes in position, all things go about. And of course, we talked about lungs and bronchospasm. Um, and again, this is, or not again, I haven't said this before. You don't want to just stop this drug because you can suddenly find them, you know, in dysrhythmias and hypertension. Now, this thing about breaking or crushing the extended release tablets, that, that applies to any extension release tablets, not just beta blockers. If, if their heart rate is less than 60. So, when you um, are giving meds, have any of you given parameterized meds yet? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What does that? What does parameterized med mean? It means that if you're giving, um, you know, something that's going to either increase or decrease the heart rate or decrease the blood pressure, uh, you have to take their blood pressure or heart rate first before giving the med. And if it's below a certain number, then you hold so the med. So those numbers are parameters, and they're actually part of the order. Mm -hmm. When you look at the order, it says. Oh, for heart rate less than 60 and systolic blood pressure less than 100. Uh, I've actually seen those orders, you know, if, if a patient has been on it for a while and, or they are, are you know, um, chronically bradycardic or hypotensive, you might see hold for less than 50 and a systolic less than 80. But typically, you know, the standard order is, is heart rate of 60 and a systolic of 100. Um, and we talked about just you know, hypoglycemia, uh, so, you know, your instruction to patients is like, you know, if you're going to get up, get up slowly and sit on the bed, dangle your feet for 10 seconds or so, make sure that, that you know, you're not going to fall face down. Or if anything, you might 
it makes us fall backwards as opposed to immediately standing up and boom, you're on the floor. Well, potassium channel blockers. Amiodarone is one that you will see. And it, you know, amiodarone uh, gets a loading dose. Which, what's a loading dose? Yes, it's often a bolus, or if, if they're doing it orally, they'll get, you know, like double the regular dose, followed by whatever their dose is. One of the things that, that um, Angular Rowan does, what, what part of, where, where will you see its effect? One of the places you can see its effect. It can prolong the QT interval. So what's the QT interval based on what Dr. Harris is talking about? <coughs> So again, it works by 
you know, impairing, if you want, the, the, you know, the calcium channel's ability to resupply the, the myocardial cells with the calcium they need to um, contract. Again, bradycardia, hypotension, dizzy, peripheral edema. Or we can talk about digoxin. We're going to talk about digoxin here in a minute. Digoxin has been used for or digitalis. How long have we been using digitalis to deal with heart issues? Um, Want to put a number on a long time? I'm guessing like 1800s, just based on the fact that it's a plant. Which plant was it? Foxlet. Yeah. So it's actually been used for at least 200 years. And maybe longer than that, but, <laughs> you know. It's, all, it's also another, it's always a way to poison people. You give them a lot, you know, you make a little phosphate of tea. <laughs> what happens to their heart? <clears throat> Does it speed up? Uh, so it speed up. Yeah, so it, it um, slows the conduction to the AV node. Oh, we're talking about, I'm sorry, I just talked about the adenosine there, which we we're, again, we again talked about a moment ago. So if you've got something that's in um, I know one of these rapid rhythms, adenosine is used as basically a diagnostic in those situations. And one of the real challenges with mixing these drugs is that they interact with each other. So if you put somebody on an amiodarone, all of a sudden their digoxin levels go way up and they slow way down. Which is probably not good. So the adverse effects, you slow the heart down, you change the cardiac output, you lower it, they can be hypotensive, they can have hypertension if you stop it suddenly, they get dizzy, weak, they may have panic attacks, I mean there's all kinds of good stuff that goes with that. So that was, that was, that one. Well let's go take a look at our cardiac drugs here. Yes, let's Anybody have any questions, or is this all making all kinds of sense and it's great and we don't need to venture into the world of beyond the lecture? <laughs> I don't know if I would. I'll make things up if I have to. No, that's not true. <laughs> oh, it's right up there on the screen. I was going to say, so tell me, what is the generic name of, you know, what's the generic suffix? Prill, right, okay. I should ask these questions before the slide though, right? <coughs> Want to tell me how it might, uh, what is the mechanism with which, you know, how does it achieve, at, no, tell me how you get afterload and preload reduction. What does it, what does it do that causes that? Doesn't it after the kidneys? The kidneys that you Okay, you're definitely on the right track. Want to expand, want to hazard a guess and expand on, you know, angiotensin. What does ACE stand for? Converting enzyme. So it inhibits the angiotensin converting enzyme. And what is angiotensin, you know, when you convert angiotensin, what do you get? Isn't messing up vasoconstriction and vasodilation? Is it the angiotensin that they constrict? Yes. Yeah, the, the angiotensin is, a, you know, the byproducts are very powerful vasoconstrictors. So that's part of it. It also affects what else? I mean, yeah, in the big picture, it, 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 it affects like ventricular remodeling, renal remodeling, but what is it doing that actually has that end outcome, that effect? It decreases the blood pressure. It decreases the blood pressure, that's true. What is one of the mechanisms involved in decreasing the blood pressure beyond just changing the vasoconstriction? Yeah, so they tend to be diuretics as well, so the water gets, so now you have less volume to move. So the heart doesn't have to work as hard, and you reduce. The, so what? Is, what is afterload? Oh no! Yes, the question. 
It's what's left in the ventricles, isn't it? No, unfortunately it's not. Isn't it how much the heart You're talking about like cardiac output. Afterload is, afterload is how hard, you know, what is, okay, when the heart has, is going into diastole and it's getting ready to pump out again, what are the things that affect how hard it has to work just to get the blood out of the heart? How much blood? How much blood is there? How far is there? Anybody know what SVR stands for? No, it's SVT. <laughs> this is a different part of the alphabet. System vascular resistance. What is system vascular resistance? It's your blood pressure at diastole. So if your system vascular resistance is elevated, if your diastolic pressure is elevated, does the heart have to overcome that just to get the blood out? Does it have to work harder to do that? Yes. So, you know, your normal ranges on blood pressure and stuff, you know, 140 over 90 is, are the cutoffs. So if the systolic is over 140, you're hypertensive. If your diastolic is over 90, you're hypertensive. And for both, you're hypertensive. Think about, like, the water pressure in the house. If the system is under 90 PSI all the time, which is actually kind of normal, probably okay, because that's what the engineer is designed for. If there's a problem with your water supply and the pressure is at 180 PSI, what do you think is going to happen in the house eventually? Pipes are going to burst. So what do you think is going on with your body if instead of being at 60 or 70, millimeters mercury for your diastolic pressure, you're at 110. What does that mean at the resting moment? You're still working and the pressure is, I mean, it's all the way elevated. So you're more susceptible to like bleed, you know, uh, ruptured vessels and stuff like that. And it also means the heart has to work that much harder just to get the blood out. So what does that lead to in terms of when we talk about, you know, um, Remodeling. Anybody ever heard of? What do you mean by remodeling? Yeah. What does that mean? What's ventricular hypertrophy? It's when the ventricles have enlarged because they've had to work somewhere. So, do you think the heart's been remodeled? Yeah. Yeah. That's what remodeling is. Oh, okay. Okay. And renal remodeling means again that the that the under you know, the, the kidneys have undergone physical changes due to higher blood pressure. And it's damaged the tubules and everything else. And I really better hurry up because I got a lot more to cover here than we have time left. So let's get back to the pearls. So they do impact your potassium. And you need to pay attention uh, to your potassium levels because in, in the process, you actually have a tendency to increase your potassium if you're on uh, ACE inhibitors. And just as low potassium is not good, is high potassium better? No. No, it causes the same kind of problems. The adverse effects for ACE inhibitors are, you know, hypotension, bradycardia. Do these sound familiar? <laughs> and why are you, so, when you're in the hospital and you're looking at somebody's labs, do you pay more attention to the BUN or creatinine? Which is more diagnostic for kidney function? Creatinine. So. I, yeah, I'm interested in BUN, but if their creatinine is rising, what does that tell you? Kidneys are, are starting to fail. That's actually much more a much more important number in terms of any you know anybody that's been hypotensive or you know you're changing your drugs, you're, they're on banco or anything like that. So and here we're going to avoid high salt foods, diuretics. What's a diuretic? It's rid of the body. Yeah. So what is what is preload? We talked about afterload. What do you think preload is? The stretching prior to construction. Yeah, how much pressure the heart is experiencing again while it's at rest on the filling side, which also 
So if you have a higher preload, what is it going to do to the heart while it's filling? Stretch it. Is it going to fill it more? Yeah. yeah. So does that mean it has to move more blood when it contracts? Yeah. Does it have to work harder? Yeah. Okay. Do I need to say more? Okay. Let's talk about loop diuretics. What do you guys get, get to give all the time? Lasix. Lasix. What are the risks with Lasix? Yeah, because it's not potassium sparing. So, it's so far out, everything just flushes everything out. The salt, you know, the, the uh, electrolytes go out, but. And it's on the list there, it says ototoxicity. And usually with Lasix, if I remember correctly, the ototoxicity is more or less reversible. But if you're on vancomycin, do you think it might enhance the effect and actually make them even more susceptible to permanent hearing them? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, polyuria. Have any of you given um, Lasix to somebody who never had it before? It's very interesting to watch. I'll just, they're peeing out like a beer an hour. And, you know, if they're not, if they don't have a Foley, they are, oh my God, you know, and if they're not angry, it's right, the problem. You're changing the bed and all the good stuff that goes with that. So, you know, these drugs are used again to manage hypertension because they reduce the amount of fluid and, you know, the, the, the physical volume that has to be circulated. Most of them, you know, they, they basically don't let you reabsorb sodium and chloride. And they can lead to hypovolemia. What's what is what does that mean? Uh, You're dehydrated. Yeah. And altered electron head levels. Yeah, that's in sodium. So it depends on where you know where the diuretics actually work in the system. If they're in the loops, basically you're dumping your electrolytes. Uh, there are potassium sparing drugs like Lothrone. Any of you ever deal with any osmotic diuretics? Yeah. Generally, you only see these again, you know, like in the intensive care. They're often given at post post cardiac surgery. They will give them mannitol to help, you know, flush everything out. And what is ICP? So, what kind of patient would be getting mannitol? Maybe. Or you know, somebody who's had a head injury, or um, maybe their uh, stroke, subdural, you know, they've got any kind, some kind of edema going on. So these actually, you know, the loop diuretics, they're very quick. You give somebody Lasix, I mean, it, especially if you give it IV, it's like, you better be paying attention. If they're on a folder, you better, it will fill, and it will fill very quickly. Um, why would you use it for uh, pulmonary edema? It helps get all of the... It helps pull the fluids up, you know. And hypertension, of course, and, you know, if they're edematous. Uh, now, if somebody has a really low, you know, uh, albumin, it may not be quite as effective just because it also, you got to get the fluid into the vasculature, and that's controlled by the osmolarity. And it doesn't really affect osmolarity directly. Hyponatremia, hypochlo hypochloride. So all your electrolytes, you know, when you're dumping, you don't get the reabsorptions. You know, the kidneys kind of work in an interesting fashion. It's like inside cleaning your house by throwing everything out and then going back and pulling in the things that you keep. And the kidneys do the same. They dump everything. And then during the reabsorption phase, they go back, oh, we'd like that potassium. Then let's hold on to some of that sodium. I'll take some of that chloride too. Um, so, depending on where your, your diuretics, uh, you know, work, you have different side effects. And they can affect, you know, the lipids, the calcium, the mag. And they interact with digoxin and ototoxic drugs and potassium sparing. But they interact with everything because they change your electrolyte balances. They change your fluid balances. Uh, they can be either oral or parenteral, right, you know. Again, now you don't... You, you know, if you're going to push Lasix, you, you need to do it. 
you know, over like five minutes, they, you have to look at, you know, if you're giving 80 milligrams, I have given 80 milligrams of Lasix push. So I'm going to give four milligrams per minute. How long is it going to take to push that? 20 minutes. 20 minutes? Can I get an order for a bag, please? You know, because <laughs> we're a little bit. But if you push it faster than that, really, they can get back here. And uh, it turns out that the NSAIDs, so if they're on, you know, at home on taking ibuprofen or whatever, the, it affects, you know, prostaglandin, which is you know, one of the places this works. So it can actually decrease the effect, effectiveness of lasers. And you're going to be, well, you know, monitoring your electrolytes. Again, it, they're, they're photosensitive. Other, hi, yeah, okay, so I think I've given uh, Bumex once, but they all have these side effects in common. Biocides, hydrochlorobiocides, HCTZ, I know we're out of time here. Let me see how many we got. Oh, I really messed up my time today. We did talk about the toxin, so uh, these are potassium sparing drugs. They, you know, they work in a different part of the kidney, and so they will, they're often given in concert with like lisinopril. They want lisinopril are often given hydrochlorobiocides as well as the diuretic to help, um, help enhance the diuretic effect, but keep, you know, hold the eyes of the passing. You don't want to use it if you're pregnant because it, um, or if you're breastfeeding, because it will get in the breast milk. Some of these are pregnant, you know, they're, they're, they're not, you don't want to be taking these in the first three months of pregnancy, it's on the rise. And right here, actually, same. Okay, so we, we talked about all those from, and so here's how these work. I mean, basically, your your from lactone, you know, it works by retaining potassium. Um, I mean, it doesn't work by that; it blocks the aldosterone, but the effect is to retain potassium and not more sodium. So you're managing your your osmotic balance that way, but then getting rid of the sodium, which holds on the water, and keeping the potassium, which is good for your your heart. What kind of a pulse do you take if you're going to get before you get the jocks? Able. Able, all right. So we actually talked about this earlier. So I'm feeling like since we're we're out of time, we're like we're two minutes here, or am I am I already over time? I don't pay close attention. I'm only paying attention to the clock because I know we're getting closer. Hmm? Am I over? Well. In that case, you guys have been really patient. You didn't have to. I mean, you are allowed to stand up to. I gotta go. I have no glass yet, too. Luckily, we did actually talk at length about the Jackson earlier.